Hey everybody, uh, Pastor Christian here, and I am continuing and going through the questions that uh, you had asked. Um, as soon as I get done with these, I'll move on to the heterosexuality questions that came in. Um, again, if it's your first time watching one of these, um, I'd like to reiterate there's a lot smarter people, a lot better people out there. Uh, I'm just doing my best to answer these um, questions concerning the message and about homosexuality that we talked about at our church. Um, yeah, so... Let's keep going here. Uh, first question, how could you talk to someone who is part of the LGBTQ community about Jesus Christ? Um, yeah, and I can understand the why the question is asked, uh, but I think it's important to know that uh, people uh, who are a part of the LGBTQ community are still people, and they're just like all other people. Um, and so what's true for all people, I, I do think, especially when you're coming, when you're talking about the gospel, needs to also be true for people of the LGBTQ community. Now, of course, knowing your audience and having special considerations there is, is important, absolutely. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, there's, there's really good uh, scriptural guidance for this on how to tell somebody about Jesus. Um, and there's not, I don't think that there's a... Uh, well, of course, you can always, you know, share the, the basic tenets of the gospel. Um, but I think there's some important components of the gospel I think that everybody needs to understand. Uh, one is that we, every person, uh, we're all sinners in need of grace. That we're, uh, one author I've read before, uh, we're all morally bankrupt. I was uh, the, the author of Pearl. <laughs> I, I read that in something that he wrote one time. We're, uh, we're all morally bankrupt. So... We need that um, that restoration, that redemption, that reconciliation that only happens through Jesus Christ. So just understanding that we're all sinners, uh, that we're understanding that we need salvation, and understanding that Jesus is the only way for salvation. I mean, that's the the basics of the gospel, um, and that should anybody cry out to Jesus, place their faith in Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your lives, then by His grace they will be saved. And so. When you get into specifically how do you uh, approach that to people in the LGBTQ community, well, you have to understand they're people too, and they they like all people need the salvation message. You know, so when when we kind of pull back a little bit, uh, one of my favorite passages of scripture that talks about uh, I I believe evangelism is uh, Mark five, when Jesus shows up and he heals this guy who is possessed by demons and um, everybody that lives in the local area, they hear about this and they kind of get all freaked out about this and they ask Jesus to leave their community. And so Jesus, uh, he does leave. And as he's leaving, the guy that he healed um, jumps in the boat to go with Jesus. And Jesus says, you know, you know, what are you doing? Why are you, what's going on? And the guy says, well, I want to go where you go. I want to follow you. Um, he, he begs Jesus. It says, uh, he, he begs Jesus to go with him. And so Jesus tells the guy, stay here and tell your people, your friends, your family, the people in your sphere of influence, tell your people how the Lord has had mercy on you. And that's what the guy does. He tells a lot more than just his people. He tells the whole region. It's called the Decapolis, which means 10 cities, um, how the Lord has had mercy on him. He shares his personal testimony of healing and salvation in Christ. Um, and, it, and, and people are amazed by that. That's a great way to tell people, regardless of what community um, they come from or they're a part of, is tell people how God's had mercy on you. Um, and then another thing I would add to that that I think is really important is uh, Romans 116. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God uh, for salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So understanding that the gospel is God's power. And so faithfulness in sharing the gospel is just that. We are not the arbiters of how people will respond to the gospel. We only have the calling to share the gospel. And how they respond to the gospel is between them and God, but it is God's power. It's not yours. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. It's not the power of man. Um, and it's not the power of the individual. So share the gospel. No, with that said, of course, we can we can plate the gospel. I mean, we can share it in a, uh, a friendly way, a kind way. And if we're mean on one hand and then try to share the gospel, then it's we're creating kind of a contradiction. So our actions need to share the gospel as much as our words do. Um, so understanding the you know just the basics of the gospel and your own story in Christ and then living for Christ, that's how um, we talk to not just the people in the LGBTQ community but all people. 
um, about Jesus Christ. So, all right, second question. Uh, as Christians, how can we best support our LGBTQ, sorry, LGBTQIA plus loved ones who want to get married, have families, etc.? Okay, so this is a this is a hard one, and this is um, um, yeah. So we'll just let's just jump right in. Um, <clears throat> we we human beings, and and so when I say human beings, maybe a better a better way to put it would be everyone. Everyone has their own opinion on the right way to do things. Um, you know, one parent dif uh, parents differently from another parent, even within the same household. Um, one family has different behaviors than another family. Um, and so every person has their own idea about what's best for them. Being a follower of Christ, uh, coming under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, what that means is that we have a, a faith and a trust that uh, what Jesus instructs of us, what Jesus calls of us, that following and pursuing Christ, his way is what's best for us. And his way is actually what's best for all people. So we should be following not our way, but his way. And I mean, that's the Christian life. Um, but Paul talks, speaks to this, you know, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So this salvation that we've experienced in Christ should work itself out in us into the world and um, to our relationships and, and it should be everything. So saying that, when you're talking about our, our loved ones who want to get married and have families, um, as followers of Christ, we believe, and I say we generally, um, I'll, I'll speak for myself, I believe that there is a uh, following Christ way uh, to get married. There is a following Christ way to have families. And so there, there is a way to do these things. Now, others who are not in Christ, uh, or <laughs> who disagree with me, and that's the, I understand that, um, they may say, well, you know, I, I don't agree with that. I think uh, I know what's best for me. And I, I can understand that. Um, but I don't think that is, uh, that's not Christian. Um, Christian itself, the word means uh, a little Christ, to follow Christ, to emulate him. So the way that Jesus calls for is the best way. So why do I, I say all that? Well, um, there's a way to get married. And, you know, even in the Christian world, there's debate over this. As I read the scriptures and as I understand them, the way to get married, the, the Christ way to get married is for um, a, uh, a man, n not a boy, but a man, a, a mature, um, grown uh, male man is to marry in lifelong commitment to a mature, grown female. And that's what, that's the way, that's the, even beyond that, though, First uh, Corinthians chapter seven um, speaks to this: the the way for marriage to occur for the follower of Christ is for a, a man to wed for life a woman, and both of them for to be in Christ. And what I mean by that is a, a Christian should not marry someone that is not a Christian. Um, and even that is a difficult pill for a lot of people to swallow, but I think it's what the scripture teaches. Now, there are times when, and again, First Corinthians seven speaks to this, where Two non-Christians may get married, and one of them comes to faith in Christ, and the Bible has instruction on that. But that is the way um, for Christians to get married. Uh, so if someone is in the LGBTQIA plus community, that is still the way for them to get married. Um, it may not be what's natural to them, and it may not be what's comfortable for them, but if they want to experience marriage uh, in pursuing Christ, well, that's that's the way um Christ calls for marriage to occur. I mean, this is Matthew 5, Matthew 19. Um, so it, that's part of it, uh, having families. Same thing, there's a, a way to have families. Um, and that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 6 speak to this. Um, but children are supposed to be a product of the, the fruitful binding in marriage, um, which which is why children are a, part of, a product of procreation. So, I mean, I, that goes into a lot, but the question is, how can we best support LGBTQ, LGBT, and the reason I'm stumbling is that when the person submitted the question, they have LGBTQIA, and I'm so used to saying LGBTQIA+. Um, 
What about our loved ones who want to get married and have families? Well, if our loved ones are in Christ, then we need to be praying for them and loving them and, and teaching them about the way that Christ has called for. And I know that's not popular, and I know that sounds, you know, it can sound unfair, but really, as Christians, do we believe that the way we want to live our lives is what's best for us, or do we believe what Christ calls for us to live our lives is what's best for us? And truly, as Christians, we shouldn't be striving to live in a way that's best for us. We should be striving to live in a way that's best for Jesus, because we've surrendered and supposed to have surrendered and given our lives over to him. Um, we have uh, denied ourselves, taken up our cross to follow him. So that's how do we support them? Well, we, we try to support them and love them and teach them uh, about Christ's ways. And we ourselves need to dig in and learn about what is the way that Christ calls for to get married and have families. But not everybody's in that situation. Not everybody is a follower of Christ. So what if we have loved ones that are in the community that want to get married and they want to have families? And I understand it. And, and that's, um, you may believe something differently for them. So how can we best support them? Well, I, I've talked about this in the other videos, but I'd say one of the best things that you can do is start praying and pray for that person. Pray for their well-being. Pray for their good. Pray for God to bless them. Pray for God to convict them. Pray for God to lead them. These are all things I pray for myself all the time, and I pray for other people all the time, for God to lead me and God to convict me. And I don't mean that to sound like a hammer I'm just throwing at people. Like I want God to convict me in those things where I'm, I'm not going in the way that he wants me to go. Convict me, um, change me, convince me. I want God always to be molding me into the person uh, that he has designed me to be, uh, which uh, scripture informs that. And rather than me always trying to get to the person that I have decided that I should be. So, um, and I know that I know that can sound really uh, harsh or, or controversial to some. So how can we best support uh, uh, our loved ones in the community that, that want to get married and have families? Uh, pray for them. Love them. Uh, I, I read from 1 Corinthians 13 before. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Look what it means to love, to not envy, to not boast, and to not keep a record of wrongs, but to be patient, to be kind, to be gentle. Um, bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit uh, from the book of Galatians. Uh, and give that type of uh, love to really to everybody, but also to um, our, our loved ones who are in the LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, but I think we should always be, our, our number one should always be with everybody. Are we being faithful to the Great Commission that Christ has called us to? So the best way to support everybody is to share the gospel, trust in God for the gospel to bear fruit, and try to disciple each other closer and closer into the, per, the persons that Christ died to make us, and that's to be more and more conformed to his image. That's kind of a long answer. I'm sorry about that. Um, all right, third question. Uh, shouldn't we as followers of Christ love our neighbors? God will judge. He's asked us to love. Yeah, it, sure, absolutely. Uh, we should love our neighbors, 100%. I mean, this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is the, it's repeated throughout scripture. What's the greatest commandment? Um, Jesus, and, and people get hung up on this. The greatest commandment is not to love our neighbor as ourself. Um, Jesus is pretty clear on that. That's the second commandment, which is like the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, so with all your strength, the, the Shema uh, from the book of Deuteronomy. So what we're supposed to do is love God first, and then we love uh, our neighbors. And it's because of our love for God that fuels and empowers us to be able to love our neighbors. And when we start judging and asking, well, who's our neighbor? And we, try, we want to try to delineate the line about who our neighbor is. That's when things start breaking apart. And that's why Jesus taught the parable of the Good Samaritan, teaching that our neighbor is anyone. Our neighbor is everyone. And we should love them uh, with a, the, the Greek word is agape, which means a self-sacrificing, kind of laying your life down kind of love. The same kind of love that Jesus demonstrates and gives to us. We should love everybody with that kind of love. Now, we can, and I, I understand this whole, you know, God is the judge and we shouldn't be judging. Uh, we have no business casting judgment on other people. That we don't. We're not the we're not the judge of their heart. We're not the judge of um, them as a, as a person, as an individual. But we can judge the fruit. We can judge the actions. We can judge the behaviors to know is this of God or is this not of God. And if it's not of God, that doesn't mean we're allowed to say, well, since you're doing something not of God, then 
judge the person. Well, I mean, and the scripture talks about this too. I mean, we're going to be, uh, God has given us discernment to have the wisdom to make judgment. We can't judge people's eternity. We can't judge people's eternal soul. Um, and we should not be judgmental of people, but we should still be wise and discerning about the actions that other people are taking. And it's okay to say what you're doing is wrong. The, the action is wrong. And people get mad at that. People say, oh, it's that whole, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin shtick, and I'm so tired of it. What? That's exactly the, the ministry in the life of Christ. He loved people to the point of death. And he hated sin. He hated the, the, the consequences of sin. He hated death. He hated disease. He hated all everything that was a result of sin and sin itself. So much so that he would die to save us from it. So there's nothing wrong with love the sinner, hate the sin. What's wrong is when we don't do that. When we, because of the sin, we don't show love to the sinner. Uh, we judge the sin and in judging the sin we start to judge the sinner and so love the sinner hate the sin there's nothing wrong with that idea that's a very christian idea we just need to be better at doing that especially on loving our neighbors and yes and it's not just god has asked us to love god has commanded us to love and so absolutely we should love but we are also we need to be discerning people to know what is of god and what is not of god so we can uh, um have also greater judgment in our in and of ourselves um, to know and that we're following him. Uh, okay, uh, the fourth question, and I'll stop with this one, is are we teaching our kids about homosexuality? Yeah, you're going to hate me for this answer, so I'll ask it one more time. Are we teaching our kids about homosexuality? I don't know. Are you? I mean, that that's this is one of those things where... Um, and I could actually, I probably, I could give a long-winded answer to this, but I'll, I'll say a couple of things. One, if if you're not teaching your kids about homosexuality, they're still learning about homosexuality. It's going to be taught in schools if it's not already. Um, it's going to be taught by culture, uh, by YouTube, um, by their friends, and so they're learning about it. Uh, the question is, are you a voice that's in that conversation? Are you a voice that's speaking? truth are you allowing god's word to be a voice uh into that conversation so are we teaching our kids about homosexuality i don't know are you you should be because um, if you don't and even even if you do the world is still going to be speaking into that as well um you know and there's there's lots of questions that people would ask at what age should we start teaching and, and really that's going to come down to each parent um praying um, looking to god following their own holy spirit convictions and that and never Never discount the fact that as Christians, the Bible says that we have the Holy Spirit living inside us to teach us and to guide us and to correct us, to rebuke us, to um, give us words to say. Uh, so the Holy Spirit, we need to trust that, that God is real and that God lives in us and that we can follow his lead. So we'll know uh, and we need to be faithful in, in when, but also in teaching our kids um, about homosexuality. And I'd say one of the most important things to teach our kids about homosexuality and I, this this bothers me. I'm going to jump on my soapbox real quick. I'll try to keep this video under 20 minutes. We we treat homosexuality like it's some exceptional sin, um, like it's the big sin that we need to talk about. Like I'm here, I am making a video about it. And the reason I'm making a video about it is because people have lots of questions about it. In Paul's day and age, um, in the in the during the time of the New Testament when it was being written, one of the biggest hot button cultural issues was. The, uh, the incorporation of Jews and Gentiles with each other um, into this new community called Christianity. You can find that theme throughout the New Testament. Uh, it's in Ephesians, it's in Galatians, it's in Colossians, um, it's, it's in Acts, it's in Romans, book of Hebrews. I mean, so it's throughout uh, the New Testament. That's not so much a, a, a cultural issue that we address a lot um, today in modern context. So homosexuality is a, a very um, prominent um, cultural discussion. So it's I understand it's it's good to have these focused conversations about it because it is so many people have questions about it. But I don't think that we should treat homosexuality as this exceptional sin while minimizing a bunch of other sins. Anytime you see homo homosexuality in scripture, it's always in uh, um, uh, a litany of other sins that I myself uh, am uh, accountable to. I myself have have committed. 
And so to, to teach homosexuality as this separate exceptionalism, we make an exception for this and all things, is I don't think that's right. I think when we teach our kids about homosexuality, we need to teach not just about homosexuality, we need to teach about Jesus. We need to teach about um, that, you know, this is why I, I've talked about Romans chapter 1, which speaks to this. Um, uh, Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1, he starts by confronting people with their sin, and in confronting people with their sin, he does reference homosexuality. But the, the main idea of when Paul's talking about all this actually comes later in Romans chapter 3. And what he says in Romans chapter 3, I think starting at verse 22, is, look, here's the deal. Um, we're all alike in the fact that we've all sinned. We've all messed up, whether it's um, greed, whether it's uh, uh, covetousness, whether it's homosexuality, um, whether it's uh, uh, disobeying our parents. That's another one he throws out in Romans 1. We're all uh, none of us, not a single person is actually wholly, totally, um, or even, I would, especially compared to God, because that's the standard he sets, none of us are good. That's what he says. All have, have turned away from God. And he, he is, uses harsh language. He quotes from the Old Testament, all have become utterly worthless, he says in Romans 3. So we're all alike in this. Um, homosexuality is not some exceptional sin that makes people exceptionally bad. It's just another expression of sin that we're all guilty of. Okay, so if that's where we're all at, we also all have the same solution for that, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, uh, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, that in Christ we can all be free, we can all be saved, we can all be redeemed. So when we're teaching our kids about homosexuality, I think we need to be careful not to make it some exceptional thing course we need to teach them about it because the world's going to teach them about it but we also need to teach that um, people who are part of the community are just like everybody else um, we're all uh, and I know it, controversy or not I'm going to say it we are all all of us broken people in need of a savior to make us whole and that's only found in Jesus Christ okay uh, sorry I went a little long today um, I'll go ahead and stop there and we'll we'll just keep working through it thanks guys